Hey, good morning. Very special day today. The day of Pentecost and today we are confirming uh, young people on the day we begin a new season of Pentecost. This is the coming of the Holy Spirit upon all of us and there is no better day than the church was established on this day. It's the birthday of the church as well in a way that God sends us out to the far corners of the world. And because of that, we have a church here, thousands of miles away from where the disciples were. There was a church all around the globe. So it's a universal church we celebrate as well. And we are here in the house of God to worship and do that as we join the entire humanity who's over a billion, probably more than that, worshiping at different time zones, different places, different languages, yet one Lord baptized in one kingdom, one body of Christ. So we are indeed privileged people, and privilege, with privilege comes responsibility. So we are here to worship God and to praise God, and I want to welcome all of you today to truly worship God and enjoy the young people and bless them with your presence. I want to invite those who are joining us on Facebook Live. We want you to stay with us and worship with us. You are part of the church. You are part of God's kingdom, and uh, stay for the entire worship. And today we have confirmation and holy communion, all that the church can be and want to be in this world. And I also want to stay with, uh, with us for the communion. Find a little faith, bread and juice at your home, and gather with your family members and join us for the holy communion. And this worship is coming to you from the First United Methodist Church of East Greenbush, New York. I'm Pastor Sundar, and I have uh, wonderful people assisting me. Uh, so I want to leave uh, that there and ask Jean to come and uh, introduce the rest of us. Good morning, everybody. I'd love to add my welcome to those of you here in the sanctuary. And we have a nice full sanctuary this morning, as well as those watching on Facebook and everyone who will be watching the recordings later the, is this week. I'm Jean Cheviak, and Karen Terwilliger and I will be assisting with the service today, and we'll also be singing with the choir, wearing our choir robes at this point. I do have a few announcements. Next Sunday is the party in the afternoon. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing everyone uh, from 3 to 5 for entertainment and fellowship with Sundar and Deb. And I'm told no need to RSVP, just come and enjoy. And a couple of announcements related to meetings. Church Council this week is on Wednesday at 7, not on Tuesday at 7. And the UMW meeting tomorrow night is at 6 o'clock, not 7 o'clock. So everybody got that? Good. On the list of confirmands, um, we would like to add that John Haas's name should have been listed as John Glasheen Haas. That's his complete name. So that's good, and we'll hear more about that later. I believe that's all the announcements, so we'll begin the service with our choral intro. Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful day. Will you please stand and join me for the call to worship? The Holy One calls our sons and our daughters to prophesy. We come ready to hear the word of God. The Holy One calls our young people to see visions. Ready to see new visions. The Holy One calls our elders to dream dreams. Um, the Spirit of the Holy One is poured upon all flesh. Now, if you would remain standing, those who can, and we'll sing number 419, I am thine, O Lord.
Mold us today, O oh, we pray. Sculpt us as your jars of clay, brimming with spirit, alive and new, visible bearers of life of you. Today, we ask that you pour out your spirit on us. And our compliments give us the wisdom and the courage to live in peace as Jesus' followers. Amen.
Okay, so this year we had um, 11 students in our first communion class learning about all the great things about communion. Um, they really had an enjoyable time and we really learned a lot about communion. And one of the things that they learned is that um, if the pastor's not at the communion, he blessed the bread ahead of time, it's called a love feast. And that's something that they all said that they love to learn. So when I say their name, they're gonna stand up in the pew. Um, and then when it's time for communion, they're gonna come up with their families first. Um, so we have Ava D'Ambrosi, Juliana Davis, Andre Flynn, Gabriel Nari, Neri, Lily Schism, Ariana Sibbins, Sabrina Sibbins, James Sweeney, Macy Trainer, Owen Valenches, and Paige Wanger Wagner. So congratulations, guys. You made it to your first companion. <laughs> like to recognize the service of confirmation and membership. Uh, I'm going to invite one command up at a time, and then at the end, we'll invite everyone up with their family. And if you'd like to follow along, it's the dark yellow sheet. Anne, could you please come forward? can turn me on too, thank you. <laughs> uh, the service is printed in the gold sheet here, so we'll follow that service. I wish uh, that you will, all of you will take time to uh, join us, and uh, it's very important that you are here, and I'm going to call that, uh, I want to just inform you, start in the beginning, sisters and brothers in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are welcomed into the body of Christ, the church, and given new birth through the water and the spirit. And all this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through confirmation, we renew and accept our, for ourselves the vows taken on our behalf at baptism. Acknowledge what God is doing for us and affirm our commitment to Christ, holy church. And I'll ask Emmanuel to read the names of each individual class of 2022 to come and stand here with us and then you'll take the vows and so will you read the names for John, Evan, Bobby, and Brooke. Come on over. Confirmation is a big deal in the church. It's very important that you not only are confirmed as you went to the class for how many months did you? A lot. <laughs> and so I've noticed that in the beginning you were, there was a hush hush group and it, as the classes progressed, you became animated and you were talking quite a bit, you know, in the sense that you became one group, and this is the class of 2022. You'll be always be remembered as that, as wonderful class. And then previously, and years later, people will come back. So you're gonna take the professing members' vows. So in this part, I will read the question. All you have to do is I do and I will, but it's not very simple as that. You mean it, because you're taking this vow before God and before this congregation's people. You know, they will pray for you. They will not accuse you of saying that you did not follow the rules. They will pray for you, continue to be there for you. If you have any questions, you can certainly go to any one of these, including your parents, uh, to ask them what the church means and what does it mean? Why are they doing this? And you can participate as a full member 
of this church later on. And uh, that's a great privilege to be on it. So here we go. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? Do you accept the freedom and power of God, give power God gives to resist evil, injustice, and oppression? I do. do you confess Jesus Christ as Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord? Will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? Will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? I will. Will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayer, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament? Remember that you were baptized and be thankful. So the parents, will you as parents of these candidates continue to support and encourage them in their Christian life? To the congregation, brothers and sisters in Christ, do you as Christ's body, the church, Reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. Will you continue to nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include John, Evan, Bobby, and Brooke, who stand before you in your nurture and care? Please be seated, and I'll call one at a time, and then you will come for your counseling. John, come on over with your family. <laughs> Sorry, making you going back and forth is fun. And those of you who are are some of the senior members of the church who would like to come and put your hand upon him as well as a blessing? Anyone can come. Anyone can come. Yes, you can come. You're all welcome. John, the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through the water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Evan? Come on over. Evan, the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through the water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Bobby?
by me, the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through the water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Brooke? Brooke, the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through the water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So one more time, I will request the councilmans to come back and stand here, and the rest of you can go sit there and bring your yellow sheets. We also do membership for the young people to be part of full members, so we do this at the same time. John, Evan, Bobby, and Brooke, as members of Christ's Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries worldwide? John, Evan, Bobby, and Brooke, as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? I will. To the congregation, members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. The God of grace, who has called us into fellowship with one another and Jesus Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. I just want to thank all of the confirmands because they did such a fantastic job this year. I know it was a really hard transition year for many of them. And I also wanted to say happy birthday to our, con our newest confirmation student, Brooke. Thank you. We come now to our time of scripture, and this week I'll be reading from the Old Testament, first book of Samuel, um, an assortment of verses from chapter 17, and I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. The Philistines assembled their troops for war at Soka of Judah. They camped between Soka and Azekah at Ephes Damon. A champion named Goliath from Gath came out from the Philistine camp. He was more than nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore bronze scale armor weighing 125 pounds. He had bronze plates on his shins and a bronze scimitar hung on his back. His spear shaft was as strong as the bar on a weaver's loom and its iron head weighed 15 pounds. His shield bearer walked in front of him. He stopped and shouted to the Israelite troops, Why have you come and taken up battle formations? 
I am the Philistine champion, and you are Saul's servants. Isn't that right? Select one of your men and let him come down against me. If he is able to fight me and kill me, then we will become your slaves. But if I overcome him and kill him, then you will become our slaves and you will serve us. I insult Israel's troops today. The Philistine continued, Give me an opponent and we'll fight. When Saul and all Israel heard what the Philistine said, they were distressed and terrified. Then Saul dressed David in his own gear, putting a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David strapped his sword, <clears throat> sword on over the armor, but he couldn't walk around well because he'd never tried it before. I can't walk in this, David told Saul, because I've never tried it before. So he took them off. He then grabbed his staff and chose five smooth stones from the stream bed. He put them in the pocket of his shepherd's bag and with sling in hand went out to the Philistine. But David told the Philistine, you are coming against me with sword, spear, and scimitar. But I come against you in the name of the Lord of heavenly forces the God of Israel's army, the one you've insulted. Today, the Lord will hand you over to me. I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today, I will feed your dead body and the dead bodies of the entire Philistine camp to the wild birds and the wild animals. Then the whole world will know that there is a God on Israel's side, and all those gathered here will know that the Lord doesn't save by means of sword and spear. The Lord owns this war, and he will hand all of you over to us. The Philistine got up and moved closer to attack David. And David ran quickly to the front line to face him. David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. He slung it, and it hit the Philistine on his forehead. The stone penetrated his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. And that's how David triumphed over the Philistine with just a sling and a stone, striking the Philistine down and killing him. And David didn't even have a sword. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second hymn this morning is number 206, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. Please stand if you are able.
I want to share with you a letter which the bishop, uh, our bishop uh, Mark J. Webb, wrote to each confirmand, and it's in their packet. We'll give them that. But quite often you don't get to read it except for the families. This is what he wrote. Dear, you know, it's, this is from for John and Evan and Brooke and Bobby. He writes, the grace and peace to you from the Lord, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to offer my words of greeting to you as you are confirmed into the United Methodist Church. The church is Christ's body by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm delighted to join with, you, with others, sisters and brothers, in welcoming you. For we are all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, with a Jew, a Gentile, slave or free, we are all given one spirit to drink. Now you are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. Confirmation is the expression of your commitment to profess your faith, commit to a life of discipleship, and to become a member of the church. You have made your faith in Jesus Christ evident in the vows you took and the commitment you continue to make. May you continue to know the depth of God's love for you in Jesus Christ and go deeper in your commitment to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. My prayers are with you as you move forward in your journey with Jesus. May God continue to bless you as you live out the call to make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Through God's grace, Mark J. Webb, resident bishop. I want us to learn and hear. This is what a connectional ministry is, that we are connected all the way to the bishop and to each other. So it's a, a wonderful, welcoming, affirming letter for our young people to be part of it. So here we are to listen to the story of Goliath, David and Goliath. You probably heard it in Sunday school. You probably know it by heart. And, and it's important to know that what spiritual lessons can you and I draw from this young person's life? David was probably 15 years old, probably like one of our countrymen. That's such a huge task to face. The entire nation was afraid to fight this man. The entire nation who said they were part of Christ, who were part of God's believers, who believed in God, who believed in a living God, and then when the time really came for them to stand up, they all were terrified. The word uses the terrified. Have you ever been terrified in your life? We all do. But here is God sending a young person to teach us what does it mean to stand firm in the face of evil. So a Sunday school teacher was telling the class the story of David and Goliath. He embellished the story with all kinds of details, emphasizing especially David's deep faith in God. He animated the gestures and movements and concluded all the details how David killed the giant Goliath with the rock from his sling. At the end of the story, he asked the class what lesson they have learned. One of the little girls, who was 13 years old, popped up and said, duck. So this morning, we want to examine one of the best stories, the story of God's child. Mind you, David wasn't a perfect human being. He made his own mistake, just like we will make a lot of mistakes as we grow older. The subcontinents and all of us, as we're getting older and older, we make mistakes. None of us are perfect. But God is there with us and for us, directing our story in this world. Listen to the word of God. Hear not only God's word, but what God might be saying to you through the reading of these words. I want you to place yourself in David's place. In verse 1, now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Togar in Judah. In verse 40, we read, then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. So bag, it's like something like this, you know, you can put it around your neck. There is a little bag, I can put it around my neck and go from there. And I have some stones here. I want to use those stones to talk about the message. David picked five stones, stones like these. 
to be sharper than these, but five stones, put him in his bag. These were his, not his sword, not his armor, everything he depended on God. He just put these five stones in his pocket. In one sense, faith in God is like that for all of us, that pouch that holds all our promises. The promises I'm going to share with you with the five stones, put them in this pouch, that's faith. And these promises and treasures are worth more than anything else. As I look back, when I was about the counter man's age, as I look now at myself, and those five things and many other things have been, have rescued my soul, have rescued my body, rescued me from all kinds of things I could have been. These are promises and treasures worth more than any silver or gold any one of you can amass. You know, we live in a world that we think that our material goods will protect us for the rest of our lives. They do for a certain point. But when you take God out of the equation, when you take God's protection out of the equation, we are treading on a really thin line. Because when you get into trouble, when the world around you storms out of control, wars and shootings and, you know, climate change and hunger, when you face the giant-sized problems of the world, you can reach into this pouch of faith and remind yourself that you are not alone. David reminded himself that he was coming before the giant in the name of the God of Israel. David was going before the people in the power of God's love and grace. And he understood who God is, that he was not standing alone, that all these giants were coming at him. And giants do come at us. None of us are protected from the giants. Confirmants and parents and grandparents, members of this church, giants do come again and again to challenge us. And God has given us the power to overcome those. I want to share with you. First of all, you can remind yourself that God loves you. I've stood here many, many times. I said, God loves you, and God loves you. God loves you unconditionally. And which is a fact, which is the true things. Because Apostle Paul says, I can do all things in Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And David said, I can do all things because God is with me. And there are times in our life we need God to do those things which we are not equipped or we are terrified. We don't know what's going to happen. What is our future going to be? What our children's future going to be? What this world is going to look like in 50 years from now? And we need to understand that, that remind yourself that God loves you. One thing, one of the things that a lot of us are troubled with is the image of God in the Old Testament, which was read, you know, which was very graphic. I intentionally put it there. I could have easily cropped it out. But I said, this is the world in which we live, war. The stories kind of remind us that if such a God is there, why should I believe in a God who loves war? And I struggle with that, and I'm sure you struggle with that. We all do that. In book studies, Bible studies, we wonder why should I follow this God who seems like God is the creator of this world? But it's not true. There is history and there is God's working through the history. Some of the passages make God look to be very angry and vengeful. Some of the stories when we read, when we fight with each other, when people go to war, when people hate other people, especially when churches get involved in those things, when those people talk about God's love, we kind of won't believe it. You know, it's, it's important to see this part of it that how we can separate our God from the history of what is happening that not mix with God and say, you know, God is on my side. And one party claims that they're a Christian party. Another party says that you're not Christian. It's a world around. We have this problem. The world around, we have this problem. And the church goes hand in hand with a lot of politics these days. But I want us to understand who this God is, who has revealed in Jesus Christ. Look at God through the eyes of Jesus. You know, that's not the God we have learned in your confirmation classes over the period of 10 months. 
And all of us learned, Jesus loves me, this I know. All of us have heard from Jesus himself that God loves you unconditionally. We have learned from the scriptures that God is love. God is compassionate, is gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. So God loves you unconditionally. And the second treasure is God knows you. Another treasure that God, how God, how does God know you? There are so many people, and oftentimes we feel that God has forgotten us. There are people who constantly tell me, you know, in, as they get older, they say, why did God forget me? I want to leave, leave and go home. I want to die. They would rather prefer to die than to live in this world because God has forgive, forgotten them. How many of you believe that God has forgotten you? Phew, that was a good question. I thought you might raise, you might raise hands. The one thing I heard this from my daughter a long time ago when we were doing tattoos. How many of you have tattoos? Anyone? You, you have tattoos? I'm just telling you. God has a tattoo too. Now don't rush and get your tattoo. In the book of Isaiah 49, 16, this is what God says. See, I have inscribed your name on the palms of my hand. I've inscribed your name on the palms of your hand. So how often do you think God sees your name? Once every hundred years? If you have your hands, God sees you every day. You are in God's presence every day. Your name is inscribed. God is saying, I have tattooed your name in the palm of my hand. You know, I have a big tattoo here. It's the name of my wife, our two daughters, and all seven grandchildren. Every time I look at their initials, I remember them. There's a tremendous amount of love and, you know, pride goes out of my heart. I thank God for them. I pray for them. I know they belong to me. They are my children and grandchildren, my wife. And I think it's, it's so important to see this part of it, that how God knows you, that you belong to God. Every time God sees your name, he's proud of you. He's so, you know, happy for you. He wants the best for you. God has not forgotten any one of us. He has inscribed your name in his palms. Not somewhere in the back where nobody can see it. In the palms, clearly saying that I love you and I am there for you and there with you. I love you so much that I've sent Jesus Christ to come and die for you on the cross. You are my child. You are made in my image. You are my spitting image. When people see you, they see me. So anyone who goes to war, anyone who takes a weapon of mass destruction and destroys another human being, they are marring the image of God. They're hurting the image of God. They don't understand that this humanity alone is created in the image of God, put his spirit in us. How important it is that all of us and our politicians and everybody should understand this. Every time they stand and say, we have all these excuses, so we can't do anything about this. They're telling God, we don't care about your image, God. Do what you can. Every time you need to remember this, that you are created in the image of God. None of us has the right, none of us has the right to mar that image, hurt that image, that human being. We are not given that privilege. We are not given that authority. Only God has the authority. He is the maker. He is the creator. He is the one who loves us and cares for us. So I want us to listen to this, that God knows you intimately, has a personal relationship with you. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. God knows you deeply, intimately, more than anyone will ever be able to know. God loves you. God knows you. And God treasures you. There are a lot of people in this world who suffer low self-esteem. They don't feel like anybody cares for them. They don't feel like they are, they don't amount to anything. Nobody cares for me. Nobody knows my name. Nobody knows who I am. But God treasures you. 
And I, you know, it's so important to hear these words that before God, you are a treasured person. Don't worry about anybody else in the world. Before God, you are a treasured person. Don't let anybody put a label on you saying that you're less than the treasure of God. It is so important to hear that and believe that and say that to yourself and treat other people as treasures. You are the best thing God has ever made in the entire creation. You are the best creation God has ever made. You are God's treasure. Don't let anybody fool that. You are truly are treasured by God. Maybe parents, you can tell all of your children today, Confirmants, you are treasures. Go ahead, parents. Confirmants, you are treasures. Let's hear. Okay, rest of you. Confirmants, you are treasured. Okay, together. Confirmants, you are treasured. My friends, another treasure is God forgives you. You see, not only God loves you, God knows you, God treasures you, God forgives you. Jesus didn't just come to be a good example. We already have plenty of those in Scripture. Jesus came to save us and to bring us back into a loving, vital, life-giving relationship with God. Jesus died for us on the cross, and today we'll come to the table to remember that that he forgives us, no matter what. There is never a time, never a place, you cannot do anything that hurts God. God will say, no, this is not, I won't forgive you. Jesus forgives you at all times. You know, it's important to remind yourself how much God loves you and want to have a relationship with you, and God forgives you. No matter how far we get away from God, in our mind, in our work, in our thoughts, and you know, forget about God and do all the things, other things, but Jesus says, I forgive you. And finally, God is with you at all times. God never leaves you, nor forsakes you. None of us can get away from God, because God has created us in God's own image. The very last verse in Matthew says, Matthew 20, 20, he says, I'm with you always to the end of the age. I'm with you always till the end of the age. There is never a time, whether you are at home or work, with a doctor or any place, you're taking God with you. And God is telling you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So David picked up five smooth stones before facing and defeating Goliath. And how many stones do you think he used? All five? Just one. It all took one stone for God to use him. God did not fight for Israel. God did not fight for David. David was in the trenches. Life is such that we will be in the trenches, but it is God's strength which gives us the victory. It is God's strength which moves us forward. It's God's strength which guides us on a daily basis in our family life, with our friends, in our communities, in the churches, in our world. It is God who guides us. God is the one who keeps us strong. Remember to use these five smooth stones of faith that God loves you, God knows your name. God treasures you. God forgives you. And God is with you at all times. And I want to say to the confirmants, I'm truly proud of you for being faithful to your journey. You worked hard. And your teacher, Amanda, for her faithfulness and being with you all these months in difficult times, trained you and taught you, heard from you, loved you. And for this church, thank you for this church that has provided a place for you, 
provided a place where you can grow in your faith, provided a place of safety, that you'll be loved by all of them. Know that you have a place in this church in East Green Bay, that you'll be loved unconditionally. You'll be nurtured unconditionally. You'll be given all the tools to be a successful and a giant of a Christian in this world. So I want to thank all of them. And I'm grateful to God for the privilege God has given me to confirm you. And all my prayers and best wishes are with you as you move forward in life. Maybe look forward to seeing you sometime when, you know, when I'm all old and decrepit. <laughs> if you're all strong and healthy, maybe you can pick me up and walk with me. And I want to ask God's blessings for all of you. Let's pray together. Our gracious and loving God, for the privilege you give us to nurture our children and our young people to grow and become men and women of God in the days to come. I thank you for each one. That you bless them, hold them in the hollow of your hand, put a ring of fire around them, keep them safe, guide them every step of the way. May they walk in your ways and be your children, knowing that you will guide them. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let us continue our worship as we bring God's tithes and our offering. I sing out a song, I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hand, I lift up my hand to the Lord. join me in the prayer of thanksgiving sender of dreams spirit of truth giver of visions accept these gifts and offerings as evidence of the holy fire burning in our hearts in christ's name we pray amen
page 17 in your hymnals, red hymnals. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and every way to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the face of the waters. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. Your spirit came upon prophets and teachers, anointing them to speak your word. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. At his baptism in the Jordan, your spirit descended upon him and declared him your beloved son. When your spirit up upon him, he turned away the temptation of sin. With your spirit upon him, he turned away the temptation of sin. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always, baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and with fire on the day of Pentecost. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood and empowered by the gifts of the Spirit. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to the entire world, showing forth the fruit of the Spirit until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. body of Christ broken for you and for you. The blood of Christ shed for you and for you.
So, a little dance here. The table of the Lord is prepared for the people of God. Come and receive this. This is uh, not an intention. This is something which you take the piece of bread and in the, take the cup. And we're not dipping anything here. So we would also invite you to use the communion rail for prayer. If you'd like to say a few prayers here for the confirmants and for yourself, please do use your time. Don't worry about how fast you need to do that to take your time to do that. This is God's house. The ushers will come forward now to, they will lead you. Yes, sorry. The first communion, come first. With your family, please. given to
we come now to our time of joys and concerns. And of course, the first joy this morning is uh, congratulations to the youth who have been confirmed and were here for their first communion. That's really wonderful. And we have another joy. Laura, Emily, and Kevin Clark have all officially been hired as full-time staff at Sky Farm this summer. So good. And those of you who are going up there will see familiar faces. Congratulations to them. And we did hear of, of, of a few more birthdays. Um, Lynette Burns today. Michael Craven is tomorrow. Emily Clark and Danielle Stacy both have birthdays on the 11th. So happy birthday to all of those folks. And as always, we have a number of concerns. Um, we learned this morning, uh, we send our, our uh, concern to Ida Bulin on the death of her brother, Robert Goodell, and also for the family, friends, and the community of Uvalde, Texas. Prayers for our church family during this time of transition. For Clayton and Betty Collins, Deb Samuel's father and his wife. Uh, uh, we pray for Nellie Smith, who's currently in the ICU at Albany Med, for Robert and Dorothy Butler, Dolores Butler, Karen Javzenski, John Moore, family and friends of Gail Clifford upon her recent death. We pray for Laura Gurley and her sons, for Eric and Gregory Zorko in the death of their father, for Scott Kelly, for Stacy Mignol, for Colleen and Vinay Samuel, for Laura Clark, Vance Sorrell, for Tom McLaughlin's friend Linda, for Sanderson's friend Linda and her family, for Eric and, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Anna and Derek Reese and the family. We pray for Judy and Ed Fountain, Evelyn Cooper, Joan Pryor, Cheryl and Jim Lambert, Patty Sharp, trans nephew Eric, Ethel Center, Sherry St. Louis, Pam Nunziato, Deb Samuels. We pray for Tracy and Don Haynes, niece Amanda, Catherine Nardacci, Randy Veely, Fred Van Ornum, Sandy Cummings, Louise Wells, Claudia Emmerich, and all of the residents of senior living facilities and nursing homes. We pray for all of these people as well as those we hold quietly in our hearts as we sing together our call to prayer. and loving God, we thank you for this service of worship. We thank you for your presence here with us, through your word, through the sacrament. We thank you and praise you for the confirmands, for each one of them. Bless them and guide them, O oh Lord. We lift up all those who need your healing hand. Touch and heal them and restore them. We pray for those who are suffering from loss, a job or a family or a health in so many ways that you bless them, restore them back to good health, O oh Lord. We pray for our nation in this crossroads of tremendous violence around the country. We humble ourselves before you, O oh Lord. We pray that you will bring peace in the hearts of all our leadership and all of us so that we might live in peace and plenty and we might live in freedom as well. We pray for our president and those who are in authority. We ask your blessings upon them. May they be guided by your love and your grace and by your Holy Spirit, that they would do the things which will honor and please you and take good care of the nation which is entrusted to them. We pray that you would be with us as we go from this place. This whole week that you remind us that who we are, 
that we are being created in your image, that you love us, you care for us, you are there with us at all times. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray silently. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is 584, Lord, you give the great commission.
please join me in the benediction, the prayer of unison. It's in the bulletin. Let's pray together. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. With hearts on fire and filled with new visions, let us go in peace to love and serve. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.